So I'm Emmanuel Ulmo, I'm uh, the director of IHES in France, uh, Institut des Hautes Études Scientifiques. And uh, before introducing our speaker, I would like to thank AXA for welcoming us uh, tonight. And I'm really honored that CEO Mark Pearson was able to join us in person. And thanks a lot. So I would also like to warmly thank the American friends of IHS and uh, for organizing this event tonight. And uh, special thanks to Rafael. And uh, for those of you who are attending an IHS event for the first time, allow me to say a few words about our institutions. So IHS is a research institute dedicated mainly to mathematics and uh, theoretical physics. And from the beginning, uh, the institute has been devoted to the international community of scholars with a small permanent faculty of out outstanding talent. So of one figure gives a good idea of IHS position in the academic landscape out of 10 mathematicians recruited as permanent professors, uh, seven have been awarded the Fields Medal. So each year, we welcome an average of 200 visitors from all around the world for research visits. Uh, they come to the institution for the unique atmosphere of scientific emulation, curiosity driven <coughs> discussion, and freedom of research. So genius belonging to no nation and IHS forms together with all the institutes of basic research in mathematics and theoretical physics, a worldwide chain of knowledge dedicated to the development of human understanding at its most complex. IHS has very strong links with the US. In fact, the founding director, uh, Leon Merchan, modeled the institute after the Institute for Advanced Study and developed strong scientific connection with its academic community. For example, Oppenheimer was a member of the Scientific Council of IHS uh, at the beginning for several years. And for over 50 years, IHS has remained close to its American friends and enjoyed many exchanges of scientists, all extremely fruitful, fruitful for uh, the development of scientific research in France and in the United States. Today, American remains from far the number one nationality host at IHS for research visits. Now, allow me to introduce a great American scientist, Dr. Robert Frey. And so after 25 years in, uh, as an applied mathematician in industry, maybe after 15 years spent in quantitative finance, as managing director in some well-known hedge fund, yeah, you decide to retire in 2004 and embark in, on an academic career at Stony Brook. Uh, so his work focused on risk management, modeling the process of uh, managing complex and dynamic portfolios. And tonight, he will present his analysis of 175 years of market drawdowns. And uh, then maybe Michael Douglas, chairman of Friends of IHS and a great physicist who also works in finance, will moderate some uh, questions and answer a small debate before we invite you to join us for a refreshment at the reception. I would be happy to meet you and tell you more about IHS and Mike and Robert. Uh, again, my warmest thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you. Well, you know, I, I, I want to thank uh, IEGS for, uh, for inviting me and uh, saying some, you know, who, and for widely exaggerating my capabilities, but I appreciate it. And uh, I also want to thank AXA for hosting the event tonight. Um, what I want to talk about is, uh, actually, I originally said 175 years, but I, I actually, it ended up being 180 years of market drawdowns. And, um, you know, I think the process of drawdowns, I, th I think there's, there's really several points I want to make tonight. One is that, you know, when we look at financial markets, we have a tendency to be very myopic in our, in our focus. We, you know, we, we calibrate our models over, you know, short periods of time. We, we estimate risks based on, you know, what's happened over the last five or ten years. 
and we think that's a long-term you know, view of things. But in fact, you know, uh, financial markets o evolve and change over time scales that are probably lo much longer than a human lifetime. So you have to look over as long a period as possible to really gain insight. Now again, the, the argument often is, is that, well, that's, you know, that's sort of irrelevant, that you know, we're, we're dealing with, you know, if you're looking at the, you know, the 1800s, you didn't have a central bank, Real, not really, you didn't really have a central bank. You had, uh, the, that was pre, you know, the early, you know, when, when I start here, it's really pre-industrial revolution. Um, now we're looking at the modern age, it's, uh, you know, we have high, high, high frequency trading, we have central bank, we have all sorts of interventions in the market. But I'm going to show here that at least in one important measure, the market hasn't changed much in those 180 years. And it's a measure that's, uh, I think, very relevant from a, from a risk point of view. It's, it's looking at, you know, a, a maximum drawdown. Okay. And so just, a, I, I don't know, just a quick bio. Uh, I worked as a, where I started as a scientist in the defense industry. I worked as a systems engineer and a program manager. Um, got my, my PhD in applied mathematics at Stony Brook University. And I was recruited into Morgan Stanley's uh, automated, uh, their, their past trading group in, in, the, in the mid 80s. Um, when that was, that looked like it was a little shaky. I, I started my own firm in 1989, uh, and I was recruited, uh, I, that, that was uh, acquired by Kepler, uh, uh, by Renaissance. Uh, that, that firm, Kepler, was acquired by Renaissance in 1992 because uh, I had started Kepler in, uh, uh, as I was a partner with Jim Simons, and, and, and then Jim. Uh, suggested that we, we merge the firms in 1992. It was one of the best uh, things I ever did. Um, I was a managing director with Renaissance. I developed the Nova and Equimetric funds, which were basically, Nova was essentially a start-off fund, and Equimetrics was a, a longer-term analysis fund. Um, uh, and then, you know, I retired from, uh, from, uh, from, uh, that, from Renaissance in 2004. Uh, I was the advisory board chair of the University of Chicago's uh, program on financial Financial mathematics, and uh, I'm founder and uh, and uh, well, founder and originally director, but now now co-director because uh, we just hired Raphael today. He's going to be my boss now, so I'm very happy about that because I can get a little rest and he can take over uh, and and I think bring the department to new heights. Yeah, we're really fortunate. To, we're, I think we're very fortunate to have him. Um, and uh, I also I also run a, a fund of hedge funds. Uh, FQS Capital Investment, which is really an outgrowth of my family office. And as a lot of these things go, I was managing money, and other people asked me to manage money for them, and suddenly we had a, we had a company. So, yeah. um, I want to talk a little about sort of myopia. And, uh, you know, t too often in finance and, and, and in life in general, day to day details overwhelm, uh, overwhelm us, narrowing our focus. And what, what I have here is a, sort of a little, a little graph, and what, this was from a blog post I had put up. And what, I, what it was was it was, a regi it was a looking at a regime shifting model of the uh, S&P 500. And I chose the period uh, 1985 to uh, 2000, this was at the time 2013, because that was sort of the extent of my, of my career at the time. You know, I started in about the mid 80s and went until, you know, to, 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 this was done in 2013. And what you can see is leading up to the 2008 crash, you can see that there was a period of, 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 of unusually low volatility. Now, what happens? You know, during periods such as this, obviously people think things are, you know, very steady and calm. Right? We also are dealing with, you know, perhaps an environment where returns tend to be sort of moderate and that sort of thing. But since things are so steady and calm and all the risks are low, what do we do? We, we leverage up like crazy in order to get higher levels of return. So just as, you know, Hyman Minsky pre predicted, you know, it's a sort of standard Minsky and sort of uh, condition, what, you know, the market becomes so levered and so, uh, you know, st unstable that it doesn't, that any little thing then becomes, it becomes a disaster and the whole market collapses. And you see in 2008, you know, we saw this, you see these marked increases in, in, in volatility. But, you know, now the, the, the trouble is, is that for many people, their whole career existed in that little valley that we, that we see, you know, sort of, uh, you sort of see, I wish I had a laser pointer. Do I have a, is there a laser pointer? I could do one. So you see here, that's a, almost a seven or eight year period. There were a lot of people, their whole careers were spent in this low, low volatility regime. And, you know, you know, you know, and if you had taken the time to go back and look in markets over a longer period of time, and again, I, I mean, I just chose this period. This isn't, this isn't even enough time because it excludes things like the uh, like, like the, the Great Depression and many other things, but you know you can see here that you know this 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 sort of low volatility period here 
you know, obviously was followed by, you know, much more erratic conditions here, but preceding it were, were, was a much higher level of sustained volatility, plus these sort of volatility jumps here, and then there was another period of low volatility, and again, you know, there was this, the, there was a peak here. So, you know, on the one hand, people, people are calibrating Gartz models and doing all kinds of crazy things. It's ridiculous. I mean, you know, they're saying that, you know, we're back to a new normal and everything, nothing's going to change again. We're even a moderate historical perspective would have shown that this was a ridiculous idea. Right? I mean, we don't do it. We, we, we tend to look at these very short time periods. We tend, not to be, we, not, we tend to be inadequate historians. We get too hung up with the mathematics, and, and, and we should be better historians. Okay? Um, and you know, that's sort of the last comment here. You don't design a house based on the weather report. Right? And, and that's what many people do with their portfolios. They, they, look at the, they, they look at tomorrow's weather forecast and build the house based on what they're going to see. And, that's not, and that, that's not a very sound way to do anything in life. Okay, okay. so let's talk about market drawdowns. Um, now, you know, an investment drawdown is, uh, the drawdown behavior of a particular investment is an important element in, uh, in its behavior. Um, what we're gonna focus on is a, a single market, the S&P 500 total return, and total return meaning uh, any, any dividends reinvested in the index. And we're going to look at the period from 1835 to uh, 2015. And the source for this is global financial data. And they have a sort of a pseudo-S&P uh, 500 for, for early periods. Okay. So you know, there's some important questions. You know, how can drawdowns be modeled and analyzed? You know, how do we sort of look at these drawdowns? You know, how stable is this aspect of performance over time? And then really, what insights can we develop examining the drawdowns in an important market over an extended period of time? And those are really the three issues I want to, I want to address here. And I, you know, what I've tried to do, I know we have a sort of a mixed audience, so I tried to be, I tried not to avoid technical issues, but I really wanted to focus on mainly the insights that you can gain from, from looking at this, looking at the, at the world, you know, from this perspective. So let's talk about cumulative log returns. So, you know, we're gonna, you know, if I, if I look at the, 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 uh, the, the, the log of the, ch of, of the ratio of wealth from one period to the next, right, uh, that, that's that's going to be uh, that's my log return. So my cumulative log return is this is the cumulative sum going over, out over time. So that's that's my basic measure. I'm going to look at the cumulative log returns. Now I want to then define my, my a drawdown state. Now what a drawdown state is, what I'm simply going to do is I'm going to just as I have a cumulative return, I'm going to have a running maximum. So at any point in time, as I go along the, the cumulative returns, I'm going to I'm going to record. The, the maximum value, and obviously, if the if if I go through a losing period, that maximum value doesn't change; it just flattens out, right? And so, what I do is I I, I get it I, I get that maximum value. Now, the difference between that running maximum and the current cumulative return is the drawdown. And so, it's fairly simple. Right? So now, what I have is I have okay. So so now, what I can do is what I have is I have these I have these these separate epochs, these separate periods, and what what I have is I can I can when I look at the, the, this drawdown number because I'm, I'm I, I don't care when when I'm doing better than 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 as I continue to hit new highs I, I don't care about that that's that's just going to be zero is from the drawdown perspective so in a drawdown state the way I've sort of defined it I'm gonna I'm gonna I, well, I'm gonna have either a period where I'm in this drawdown state so I'm gonna have a continuous period of drawdown observations that are non that are non-zero. And that's going to be interspersed with periods where all of the observations are going to be zero, which represent periods where the market is rising, right? So that's, I, I'm going to use that fact to partition the, my drawdown, the drawdown states across time into, into partitions. And then, I'm, and then the drawdown process I'm going to study is I'm going to simply take each, each subpartition and I'm going to look at the maximum drawdown that occurs in each partition and I'm going to look at the duration of time over which that drawdown occurred. And so I have a sequence of observations now which characterize the, what I call the drawdown process for, 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 the, uh, for, for, the, for the particular investment. Right? So it's a fairly simple idea. So this is... Uh, the partition is arbitrary? No, it's not arbitrary. It's based on the actual behavior. So, it, it, yeah, so if it, it's a contiguous... If the partition is contiguous segments where you're either in a drawdown state or not in a drawdown state. So it's an, the, the partitions arise naturally from the data that I'm that I'm constructing. Right. So let's look at the full data set from 1835 to uh, 2015, and that's sort of a. So what we have here is the log uh, log index, and this is the uh, 
and this is the S&P total return index from global financial data. And you can see in here, you know, these little red periods, those are drawdowns, right? These little periods are drawdowns. And you can see, for example, you know, the, the, the Great Depression, right? That's, a, that's kind of a really big one. But, you know, in, in general, this, you know, as an investment, this looks pretty good. Over, you know, if you're really looking very long term, there's a steady increase over time. And, uh, you know, it looks wonderful. And, you know, uh, it's easy to forget that those little dips where, where, that are filled in with red where you're in drawdown uh, sometimes are, you know, five, six years of pain and suffering. You know, we, we forget that sometimes. Um, and in the case of the uh, Great Depression, much, much longer. So, um, but you know, this, this is the process. Now, if I, what I do now is I simply look at those drawdown processes, and this is, this is what I end up with when I, when I look at that. Right? And uh, so again, this is again 180 years of drawdowns. Now, what's this it's kind of something surprising here. I mean, if, when I look at this, you know, I, I see fa a fairly steady increase over time. But when I actually pull out and look at the drawdowns, um, the drawdowns are everywhere. I mean, and they're, they're, and they're all different sizes. There's little tiny drawdowns and little big drawdowns. And in fact, you know, what, what we'll see is that, you know, um, what's interesting about, about this process and what's maybe relevant from the point of view of an investor is that you're, you're usually in a drawdown state, even, even in a very good and positive investment, you know. Um, now, this is also something, uh, this is a, uh, what I did is I looked at the drawdown period, which I identified as tau. So that's the length of the period versus the, 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 the size of the period, okay? And uh, I did, I actually just, I just did a linear regression and, you know, this, these, are, these are highly significant. Um, and it basically says that the, the length of the period is proportional to the, uh, to, to the size of the drawdown. And I did, I just, just for the sake of sensitivity testing, what I did is I, 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 I looked at all of the data, but obviously I have a couple of high leverage points out there. Um, so if I look at, if I exclude the top six outliers, I get, uh, I, I, I get the dash line, which is really pretty much pretty close. So you can, you know, there's a pretty, pretty much, at least from what we can see here, a, a pretty linear relationship between the length of the drawdown period and the size of the, the maximum drawdown. I mean, again, it's expressed as a log. Um, also, I should mention that these, this was weighted least squares because it's also pretty obvious that the, the variability is proportional to the size of the drawdown period. So what I did is the, the weight is, uh, I, the weight is basically was one over the length of the period. So I'm, I'm assuming that the, the variability of, a, 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 of the drawdown is, is, is proportional to the length of the period, right? which is not an unreasonable, not an unreasonable thing. So I just want to, so, so what we get here, and now again, you know, I have a, a much fuller analysis here where I, I do develop analysis of the joint distribution of these two things. But what I'm going to do is I'm, going to con I'm just going to concentrate for now on the, on the drawdowns themselves rather than the length, the, how deep the, the, mac the size of the maximum drawdowns and not talk a lot about the, their lengths, although there's some interesting work there for that. Because I'm, I'm trying to make this as accessible as possible. Now, one of the things that's, that's interesting is that, you know, you, you have this, you have the sort of the S&P. And again, stepping back and looking at the cumulative plot of the S&P, we see, um, you know, a, kind of a fairly steady upward slope, you know. Uh, um, yeah, sure, there are draw drawdowns in there, but, you know, on the scale, on the scale of, 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 uh, of the increases over this period, you know, first of all, the, 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 the slope is reasonably constant, and uh, the drawdowns, again, don't, you know, again, with the perspective of, 200 year, of almost 200 years, don't seem very large. But if you look at things in the small, right, what happens is that, you know, you say, okay, you know, what if I pick a random point in time here? What's the probability of a random month being uh, in a drawdown state? Now, again, you get, what, what does this mean? Well, you know, you know, it means that if you're an, you're an investor who's been invested in this market for any period of time, what's the likelihood that at any random time you're looking back at a high high water mark that you're under you're un, from your point of view you're underwater? And it turns out that's true 75 percent of the time. So 70, so I, and I think that surprises most people. Most people, if you asked, you know, about the market, you would say, well, how often am I, you know, okay, I, how often am I sort of in a, in a state of regret? Right, let's call it that. And um, the answer is, even with something fairly well, fairly attractive like the stock market, and again, this is there's a certainly survivor bias here because it's the U.S. stock market, and it's you know obviously there's there's an implicit survivor bias. Um, you you know even even in the U.S. stock market, which is probably one of the most successful 
you, you're, you're in this drawdown state, this state of regret, 75% of the time. Then I just chose sort of an, not, not entirely arbitrary, but a 20% but a drawdown. Again, it's a log 20%. 20% drawdown as being a, uh, like an excessive, a large drawdown. And of that 75% of the, 75%, about 60% of the time, you're in, you're in an extreme drawdown, something over that 20%. Right. So, so what it what it, what that implies is that you're somewhere around well, sixty. I say, so, you know, you're you know about forty forty percent of the time you're in forty five percent of the time you're in a really bad situation. You're you have, you're you're in a state of significant drawdown. Now, again, I think that this this is kind of an underappreciated fact. I think when people look at investor behavior and look at the psychology of investing in markets, we tend we tend not to focus on the fact that. For the app, for, for a typical investor, even one you know who has you know as long as their 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 horizon is over more than a few years, most of the time they're going to be underwater. Even though in the long run, they they do tend to make money, and this is kind of a, I, I think something that kind of interesting. I, you know, I don't and I don't think it's something. And I think it's sort of one motivation for focusing on drawdown as as a very important measure because I think it drives a lot of what people do in markets. Uh, you know, because that insight of that's that, you know, because where does regret come from? We, because you know, we we naturally anchor our viewpoint to our, our last highest, you know, wa high water mark. And what we're saying is, most of the time when we're in, we're investing in anything risky, we're we're in a state of regret, and that puts tremendous stress on an investor. Tremendous stress on an investor. The second thing is, is that from just from a simple mathematical view, we know that you know. When, when you do get a drawdown and your capital base shrinks, you have to, you know, it's just a fact of life that you have to do much better when, you know, if, you, if you've if you lost 50%, you have to make 100% to get out of that, right? That's right. The losses and gains aren't symmetrical. So being in a drawdown state also creates that stress of having, a, you know, your capital base is shrunk uh, and, and the amount of performance you need to get back to even now is, is much higher. So. You know this this whole notion of drawdowns. I think is uh, we we tend to underestimate the stress on on, uh, on on investors, and we tend when we think about investor behavior, we don't we, we you know we tend not to talk enough about drawdowns. I would say. Okay. So let's just look at that. So this is sort of the standard kind of plot, and it's a log log plot. And what I have is the, uh, the survival function uh, uh, along the abscissa, and the uh, uh, the x-axis is the max drawdowns. And um, you know here, you know this is where you would sort of, you know, th you know, typically if you have a Powell or a tail, you see you see sort of a straight line, and I have sort of this gradual curve, and um, you know, if, again, based on looking at other other financial indices and, and other and other uh, uh, um, and doing looking at various looking at various subsets, you know, this this thing never really settles down. You, you get this sort of curve, but it never really settles down to to, to zero. So. You know, after looking at this, you know, I was sort of trying to develop, you know, and also, by the way, I'll, and I'll show shortly that if, if, you have, if, 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 the, if the returns were normally distributed, um, the, 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 draw, the, the, the uh, distribution of drawdowns is exponentially distributed. But what we have here is we have actually some quite fat tails. So what I did is, that, you know, I was trying to develop a max drawdown, and I, and I sort of, again, based on fitting various, looking at, the, looking at these log-log plots, which is the Typical plot that you know Mandelbrot first introduced to show you know tails in, 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 in these distributions. Um, I came up with just basically a gamma exponential mixture. Right? So, this, so this I realized after I went to the trouble of solving this that this is just a variant of the Pareto distribution. It's typically called the Lomax distribution. Uh, the only difference is that beta is usually a scale parameter, sigma that's divided into the uh, into the variable. But I, I just kept it in this form. So, so what I'm saying is that the PDF of the uh, of when I look at when I sort of fit this, the PDF of, of the max drawdown, and again, that red. So, looking at each epoch, the maximum drawdown I experience in each epoch, the, the PDF follows this Pareto. This this is a Pareto type four distribution, basically. All right. So that's its that's its. Um, so what I have here is, you know, this is the this is how this is how it's derived, right, from 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 the. Uh, for, this is a beta distribution, and I'm integrating over an exponential distribution, and I have this PDF and that and that uh, CDF. Okay, so when I do that, um, so when I so now when I'm going to look at the max drawdown distribution, again over this period, I get uh, I, I get I get a um, 
this Pareto distribution, I get an alpha of 1.8 and I get a beta of 13.7. Uh, okay? And that's a very good fit. That's an excellent fit. I mean, the fit is, I mean, I use the Prima von Mises generally, that's my preferred test, but this, this is, this is a very, these, this is very close. I mean, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty clear, you know, that this is, uh, this is a, an excellent fit to the, to the data. And you can see here what I have is the red is the theoretical and the blue is the empirical. Okay. So now I said, well, let me, let me just sort of look at a Gaussian simulation to see, see, see what I get with that. So this is just, now again, obviously I looked at a lot of simulations, but this is just one of them. I just wanted to look at one of them. So there's, there's the, the same sort of graph showing, you know, uh, and I see, you know, I see the drawdowns. I see, you know, a lot of, I see a lot of the drawdowns. And um, notice they're a lot smaller, and, and, but I still get, you know, it doesn't look dramatically different. Um, here's the drawdowns. Now notice here, notice in contrast, you know, the, the drawdowns here are, are much, they're not as widely, dis widely distributed. They look more similar to one another. Right, than, than in, the, in, in the real market case. Um, so now when I, when I sort of look at this case of, again, I'm gonna look through this same sort of div division of, uh, you know, what percent of time are you in a drawdown state uh, versus what time percentage of time are you in an extreme drawdown state? And what's interesting here is that, you know, uh, for the Gaussian, this Gaussian, and this is a typical result, is that it's, you're in fact slightly, you're 80% of the time you're in a drawdown state, and of, the, and of that 80%, about 67% of the time, you're in a sig more than 20% for that. Right? So again, you know, even with Gaussian well-behaved Gaussian uh, uh, distributions, you're you're you know you're you're dealing with a thing where you're in a state of regret most of the time, right? You're 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 going to bed with you know upset stomach because you know you've lost money in the market. You're not sure what's going to happen and that sort of thing. Okay, so all right. Now now the now the, the but this, the real difference here is that rather than a rather than a Pareto distribution. The distribution of of uh, uh, the distribution of uh, of max drawdowns follows an exponential distribution, and here's you have the theoretical and the uh, and the observed, right? And it, it was actually that doing that which led me and, and some theoretical arguments about you know the, sort of the, the relationship between stable and distributions and uh, um, and, and uh, well, normal is a stable distribution. Normal distributions and alpha stable distributions, which led me to the idea of looking at mixtures of exponentials. And um, so um, you can see here that you know we, we have an exponential distribution. And again, this is this is a very close fit. Obviously, this is the C CDFs. Um, the CDFs match each other extremely closely. And uh, you know, and now, and now, so what's nice about this is that we're not characterizing. You know, now, on one hand, you, you could say you know we're looking at in some sense. The tails, but we're not characterizing the tails of the drawdown distribution. We're characterizing the entire drawdown distribution. We're looking at the whole thing. And the whole thing follows, let's say, this Lomax distribution. And again, for normal, you, you, these things are universally exponentially distributed, which is something much, much less uh, a high tail. Right. Now, I, so then I said, I said, well, let me fit an alpha stable, fit a type 1 alpha stable distribution to the data. And again, I, I ran many simulations there, but this is. I'm going to give you a sort of a characteristic one. So, and you can see right away it doesn't look anything like the the real data. Right? It doesn't look anything like the real data. And again, this is um, um, you know you you, you you do get a you do get a you do get a uh, um, um, you do get a, an alpha similar. I think it's 1.6. I, I have that plotted, but. Look, look, you, you see that you know, you know, and, and part of the problem is is that the alpha the, the, What's interesting is the, this: the, the, the when I fit in a single alpha stable distribution to the to the data, I get too many large excursions, and that's what causes a lot of the drawdowns, and also sometimes ends the drawdowns. Right? So, right? so again, when I look at the drawdowns, you can see here, and also the size of the drawdowns are much much higher. Over this, over again, I, I I have this simulated same period of time, and where whereas the Great Depression hit hit about uh, again a log drawdown of one point eight or so, um, you you see here you're hitting much higher distribution, you know, much higher much higher levels with with the uh, out stable. So a stable distribution, at least not a single stable distribution, doesn't um, doesn't really hack it. And I, I will tell you that you know I'm I'm, I'm in the process of firming this up, but you know, 
it's obviously that the market has some state memory and, and that you know, you're dealing with a mixture of such alpha stable processes that are, you know, so, but there, there is also some state memory that, that gets in here to, to, to change this. But, so we're saying that just a stable distribution doesn't do very well. However, one, one thing that's interesting is that, you know, again, you, you see the same pattern. 83% of the time you're in a drawdown distribution, 84%, you're in a drawdown distribution, and 69% of that time you're in a significant drawdown. And again, this is everything having the same, you know, you, in this case, the alpha stable was fit using the same, uh, using the same uh, um, data. And again, um, that's, that's the fit. And it, it turns out, though, that the alpha stable distribution does fit the Pareto type 4 distribution. Um, I guess it's a two parameter version. And it has an alpha of 1.6 and uh, beta, of, uh, and this, the beta, and actually, the, Again, the normal the normal form would be the reciprocal. Can you say a little more what you mean by stable? What an alpha, well, alpha stable? Well, stable distributions are distributions that when you add them together, you get another stable distribution. So there's a there's a class of distributions developed by Levy that that have this property. Now, you know the Cauchy distribution is an example. The normal distribution is an example. You know, so when you combine these, you you actually a Poisson distribution. When you combine that, you get another Poisson distribution. But there's a class of distributions where there's generally no closed form for the PDF, but where and you have generally infinite variance, and that's that's generally the sound. So, so, so you say the point is that just from the data, there's not like one single distribution of possibilities which is happening again and again. Something must be changing within the market. Right, right. But it's changing in a consistent way across time because I don't when I break this up into pieces, I get the same. Thing. Seems to be getting uh, the view was, was the change in sigma. Yes, exactly. That's, that's what I think it is. I, 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 and I and and the sigma seems to and the sigma sigma doesn't seems to have persistence. So I'm really what I'm really trying is a Levy stable, you know, essentially a hidden Markov model with alpha stable emissions. Basically, that's what I'm looking at. So. And how, how persistent is that Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna do I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna cover that. But that's a good question, right? And, and what I tried to do is I tried to make the the, the break breakouts sort of meaningful and. In a sense, um, because I'm, I'm really trying to sort of again think of it from a as much from the point of view of the history that I'm looking at as anything else. But so so I, but again, what's what's clear is that if I have, with the alpha stable distribution does have these the drawdown state which does resemble this Pareto distribution as is the other case. However, it's also clear that it's a single distribution doesn't capture you know actual stock market returns with any real fidelity. I mean, it's just not true. Is a daily return? No, I, I did monthly because monthly. because I, I wanted to get as, as long a period as possible. And daily returns, when you go back 200 years, really don't mean much, really. So, they don't? Yeah, yeah. No? Yeah. No. yeah. Well, what about truncated alpha stable? Because normally, truncated the Right, you mean like a temperate stable? Yeah, I, didn't, I, I, I have looked at that, and I, that's not here. But yeah, that, you can, I mean, that doesn't change things that much. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, right, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So, all right. All right, so let me look at what I want to do is I'm going to first look at the uh, pre, -great, pre, pre Great Depression. Because remember, when I, let me go back up here. Um, when you look at um, the original data, you know, you have the Great Depression in there. So, you know, everybody, you know, the maximum of hitting are hitting about 0.7, uh, the other one. Then you have the Great Depression that goes up to about 1.8. So let's see if we sort of take that period out and look at the period before. And that's a 93-year period. So that's the that's the period prior to the Great Depression, and uh, you know qualitatively, you know it doesn't really look different. That you know when, once you scale it down, it doesn't really look different than you know the whole data set. Um, again, when I when I when when I when I look at it from the point of view of fitting the uh, distribution, I, I get again a very excellent fit. Uh, I get a, I get an alpha of 1.8 as opposed to. Uh, 1.65, I guess, was, was, was the, uh, no, it was about 1.8 1. 1. for the whole thing, I forget. But, you know, it doesn't look very different. So, so the point is that, yes, it's clear that there is, that, that, you know, a single alpha stable distribution doesn't handle it. It's clear that it's changing over time. But it's also clear that when I look at this, when I look at this pre-Great pre Depression period, it's changing at time levels that are, 
less than, than, than that. And, and, and you know, it's, it's changing in the same way. I, I mean, it looks the same, right? The, the underlying process looks the same. And again, I have the same thing. I have, again, about 78, 75, 78 percent of the time you're in a drawdown, and about 60 percent of the time in what you might consider as a highly significant drawdown. Okay. All right. So, so now, so that was 93 years. And again, you know, we had a, you know let's look at a post World War II. And I, I wanted to sort of, uh, you know, we, we had the obviously World War II ended in what 46, I guess. So. I wanted to give a few years for recovery, so I started 1950 to 2015. So that's 65 years. That's a little bit shorter than the first, the, the other period. And again, here's here's the most more recent period. And again, this kind of looks, um, you know, sort of very similar. Doesn't really, things don't really look all that odd. Um, again, now uh, alpha is a 2.3. Uh, and again, if you, you know, I did some bootstrap estimates. You know these 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 alpha coefficients are virtually are really quite indistinguishable from one another. They're really not that, that dramatically different. But uh, you know I, I, now again the significance of an alpha point to, to being over two is 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 there's some significance there. But it, you know, at an alpha of two point three and again beta the, the the what you might think of as a scale parameter is a, a eleven. So again it looks very similar in this period as well. So. When, when I'm looking at these three periods, I'm, so I'm looking at the whole period, and I find, okay, I have a certain, you know, certain behavior, and I find, uh, so then I, but I have in the middle of this, this, this tremendous distortion, perhaps, caused by the, the, the Great Depression. And so, you know, what I do is I sort of, let me, all right, so let me take that out, and, and let me look at the before and after periods separately and see if things look, at, look any different. And the answer is, at least from the point of view of drawdown, they, they don't look different at all. You know, they don't they don't they haven't really changed changed at all. And again, um, just I mean, think about that. You know, we're talking about you know a, a, a sort of a basic element of market stability. How much does it drop before it comes back again? You know, right? That's a very important you know consideration for any investor for anybody planning investments. And there's no evidence that you know it was different in 1840 than it is in 1940 than it is in 2015. Not 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 dramatically so. Um, now again, you know what's different? I mean, you know, I mean in 1907, you know, um, uh, who is it? J.P. Morgan had to organize all of the bankers to put money into the into the market because there was no central bank, right? Then we had you know the Great Depression, which probably because we had a central bank that didn't know what it was doing, we got a, we got a Great Depression. <laughs> Then we have 2008, which is again, you know, but you know, what's interesting is that if you look at all of these interventions and all of the changes in time, um, at, at least this basic, this aspect of the market, this basic kind of an interesting ex characteristic of the market hasn't really changed in 200 years, right? Now think about all this other stuff that's changed. We have, we have high frequency trading, we have all sorts of regulations, we have, we have uh, you know, a, a central bank which although it's not its official mission, really does consider the stock market stability as part of its mission, although it's not supposed to, right? But there's no evidence that any of that has any effect whatsoever on the behavior of the market, right? The, draw, the size of the drawdowns, the distribution of the drawdowns, you know, um, aren't the same. You know, when you look at something like the, the Great Depression, if I exclude the Great Depression, and then I say, how likely is something like the Great Depression to happen? Yes, it's a rare event, but it's not a terribly rare event. It's you know, it's an event that might happen every couple of lifetimes or something like that. I mean, it's not, you know. Um, so I mean, so again, I think you know, th th there is a there is a consistent behavior in the, in these drawdowns over time. I think that uh, it's it says something about you know markets in terms of how they're driven, perhaps by human nature and everything else. And so despite everything that's changed over the last 180 years, um, this aspect of the market hasn't changed much at all. Okay, okay so let's look at some comparisons. Again, here's the, uh, again, here's the PDFs of the uh, draw max drawdowns. Again, so again, so for each drawdown epoch, you know, obviously I took out the uh, pieces that weren't drawdown. So for each drawdown epoch, I took the maximum drawdown. Um, and looked at the distribution, and here's the three PDFs. One is for the whole period, uh, then then for the pre pre uh, pre Great Depression and post, and then the third post war. They're virtually the same. 
Here's the, uh, here are the uh, um, CDFs. And again, you can see the, 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 uh, the uh, post-war looks a little bit better. But I, I'm going to argue that, I mean, someone might argue, well, that, isn't that some evidence that things have changed? But you know, you got to remember too the the uh, the uh, the uh, pre-war the pre-war I, I had 97 years of data, post-war I had 65. Frankly, my experience is the more data you have, the smaller the exponent tends to grow, right? Right. So uh, that the the fact that the 1950 to 2015 I think is more likely due to the fact that I had a smaller period of time that the exponent was slightly higher. I don't really. You know, and certainly from a any kind of you know I did when I did some bootstrapping I it, there's really no difference here. So what we have here is a very you know we have an again a, a critical element of stock market behavior that's that's constant over a very very long period of time. All right, so let's let's compare the drawdown. So again, the, I think the key here is that the basic character of uh, the max drawdown um, is is reasonably similar across time, I mean, roughly just shy of two centuries, right? Um, there's a recent period that does show a slightly lower incidence of larger drawdowns. But again, I think that might be an artifact of the, the like say, the lengths of the intervals I was comparing. You know? um, when I look at the probability of a larger max drawdown, so I'm looking at the tail of the distribution. When I look at these three periods, and I'm looking at a 20%, a 40%, an 80%, and I mean, this is a log drawdown, so it, it goes out to, it goes out. So well, a one point, one, uh, log drawdown of 1.6. Um, you know, the, the probabilities don't dramatically change. You know, I mean, I, I, mean, I see, you know, um, you know, you're going to see significant drawdowns in all cases, and and again, I, again, obviously, when you when you look at those those extreme events, the, the, those are very noisy. I don't, you know, uh, none of this stuff suggests to me that we're dealing with a process that has changed in any fundamental way. Um, and again, so I think that that kind of does does surprise me because I did expect to see some effect of of the interventions from from. Uh, you know, from, from government and everything else, and I, I just don't see it. You know, I mean, say, I mean, the market, the market in 1890 and the market in 2015 don't look at all different. I mean, it just doesn't look, it just doesn't look. All right, so, so what are my conclusions here? I want to talk about this, that, you know, market as a driver of regret may play a greater role than we realize. You know, I, I don't think we think in terms of, we think in terms of drawdowns and we understand how, oh yes, we're going to control max drawdown, but I don't think we think about the fact that most of the time an investor is facing a, a drawdown when, 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 they're, when they're investing, and that scares the hell out of them, right? right? So you have that psychological factor may, is something that you should be considering, right? And, and whether you're doing theoretical work or, or practice, you're in the practice of advising an investor, right? Um, the character of the market over the past 180 years, again, doesn't seem to have changed greatly. And again, you could look at any number of other related things. I think I, I like I like drawdown because it was such a kind of a, to me it was an important measure. And and by the way, it was being driven by some research I was interested in, frankly, managing my own investments. You know. um, yes, sir. True. No, that, but I control for them. No, but I mean, I think the the uh, I mean, those might be explanatory variables that may explain some of that stuff. But it's pretty clear that to the extent that they affected the behavior of the market, it, it didn't change from one period to the next. Yeah. So well, at this point, I'm not trying to diagnose anything or trying to go any deeper. But for two reasons, one, one is that I ha I do have much more analysis, but I wasn't sure of the level of the audience. I mean, I know there's people at all different levels, and I wanted to talk about something everybody could sort of appreciate. So, but, but the answer here is that, yeah, yeah sure, I'm, I'm sure, I'm, you know, obviously flows in and out of the market are gonna have a dramatic effect on, on, on the volatility and, and what happens to the market. But there's no evidence that it's different now than, than two weeks ago. Yes, yeah, here's a dilemma. One thing that just changed significantly in the markets is the size of the distribution of financial losses in systemic evidence. So you would think that somehow this premium had increased, right? And that it should be reflected in, in the stock market somewhere. Well, again, if you, yeah, okay. Well, let's, let's let's. I mean, let's examine that. But you know, if, if you know, we, we just we just saw that. Uh, you know, if, if I look at the recent period, <laughs> and I look at sort of the ma that maximum drawdown in those periods, right? Um, 
I don't, I don't see any difference now today. So some of what you're saying is that in some important way things have not changed. That's, that's, that's what I'm saying. I mean, from, from the point of view of someone, you're saying, you know, should the risk premium be different? But I, I don't, why? Why should it be different? Because again, financial losses tend to explode. You see this sort of exponential growth of how yeah, but, but that, to the other. But, well, no, no. I mean, that, but that's but that was true in the past as well. I mean, you know, I mean, that was true in the that, past. That's exactly, that's exactly opposite what he's saying. He's saying that privatization, if you were to do it in any sub period, would change from what it is today. It doesn't change from what it is. Right. And that you always think, hey, you know, it's the, the yeah, there's always think it's something different now and stuff like that. It's not. It's the After same. After a large deviation, you think that you know the, the privatization has changed. In fact, flat tail data. Right. Okay, right. Require you to update. It. Right, it's, it's the same. And, and also, you, you talk about sort of things that the financial markets being, you know, the, the world, you know, one of, one of the reasons the Great Depression was the Great Depression was because we had become integrated globally, you know, trade-wise, right? Now, that we, we didn't get back to the same level of global integration in terms of cross-border cross, cross border trading until, I think, I think it was like the mid to late 50s after the Great Depression. So, you know, there's, there's you know, um, I, you know, there's plenty of, you know, I, I don't know. I, I mean, you're saying that it has increased. Maybe it's increased from, you know, 10 years ago, but I don't think it, but again, when I stand back and look at this 200 year period, I'm saying that, no, it hasn't increased. It's, it's maybe, it may be in a high state or a low state, but it's been in those states before. That's, that's what I'm saying. Okay. All right. Yes, sir. Yeah, like that, yeah. So if you were to take a uh, 2000 um, daily return starting from today going back uh, uh, 8, 10 years, right. would you roughly see the same yeah. thing? In other words, there is a sort yeah. of similarity yeah, on a much is. smaller scale. Right? Yes, so right. This, uh, yeah. And the second question, uh, that, and even if you look at, say, Minute by minute returns and so forth. Oh, that I haven't. That, 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 although I have access to that, we, we do have tagged. I didn't look at minute to minute. Yeah, but, but, yeah. but I assume I yeah, wouldn't be surprised to find it. I wouldn't be surprised to find it. Yeah. Right. yeah. And the second answer to your to that last point, I know that people compare what the the, the week of trading after eighty seven right. compared to the flash crash within an hour. Yeah. And it was you know it was surprising how it was how similar. Ah, yeah. okay. Yeah. 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 But okay. the second question is, in some sense, you were alluding to this in the beginning, that we're dealing with a survivorship basis, right? There are Absolutely. Other stock markets, uh, which were simply completely destroyed, like Absolutely. Berlin and Tokyo. And in fact, uh, what right, I mean, yeah, happened? It, it, this, uh, and in fact, if you look at my last point there, I said any study such as this suffers from survivor bias. That's my last point. Mm -hmm. and, and the fact that we are likely to have probably underestimated our, our alphas because we, we don't have a lot of data here. So, yes, I mean, yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, I fully admit that. I mean, this is, I'm trying to describe certain things and observe certain things. But yeah, there's some real limitations here. And I think, but I think it's important. It's okay to use this stuff as long as you understand those limitations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but what I've tried to emphasize is perhaps it would be even worse if you were to look at stock markets, which then have disappeared for a few years. Like in Tokyo, they had extremely brisk uh, trading between the beginning of the war and 44. It was very, very brisk, and then it was the well, the, the, the answer is like, if you look at, and actually, I have to, if you look at the, again, this isn't here, but if, you, and I, we can talk about this later. If you look at the stock, because one one advantage of global financial data is that I can get this data. If you look at the losers in World War II, yes, they look a lot worse than the winners in World War II. So I've I've looked, I've done the same thing, for example, with the with the uh, English stock market. And even though England was subject to great stress during the war, you know, had bombings in London and stuff like that, you did not. You, you see pretty much the same pattern as you do in the United States. Um, and, and, you know, um, so, so you don't really see, that doesn't change. But if you do look at some place like, uh, um, you know, say, say uh, um, pre-World War II um, Germany, right, which is, you know, you look at the, uh, you know, well, the, uh, the, the fall of the, the, the regime, you know, you, you know, obviously you had, you know, immense hyperinflation, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, and if you look at Japan post World War II, you see the same thing. And what you see is just bigger drawdowns. I mean, yeah, but they're eh, you know they're not that different. You know. I mean, you, you know, you, you see that. You, I mean, yes, but there is a survivor bias here in the sense that you know 
there's no lost dwarf in the that the United States has experienced during this period. You know, um, not really. You know, and and if you had one, you would see a much bigger event. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah do, yes. do you know have there been uh, behavioral uh, economic studies that try to reproduce anything like this? Uh, try to well, you know that that's backwards. Yeah. The early economic study. You know, the yes, war with yeah. the Scott Taylor, who's yeah. an entertainer, who's a uh, Behavioral economic uh, guys are entertainers. He did the exact opposite of, of this talk. If you listen, these guys think that you're, uh, you should invest in the stock market based on myopia of computed off of calcium. Well, that so, was yeah. not my. I mean, that, that's amusing. But I'm, I'm, I'm asking more if people have tried to construct experiments where people form an artificial market. From what I've seen, in, in the, it's, I mean, obviously, I, you know, you, you, when you read the behavioral literature, this notion of. Uh, uh, of anchoring is a, is a big is a big deal. Right. So obviously, people, I think, you know, if you ask the guy, well, you know, w what would a person feel in a drawdown state? They'd feel regret. But no, I, in terms of actually looking at the distribution process, uh, that, that that process, that drawdown process, and saying how it's actually going to influence a, a, an investor, no, I haven't, I haven't seen anything. Yeah, perhaps, yeah. perhaps you could create a. Well, I, I actually, my argument there is that somebody should. Yeah. I, that's I'm, that's not my area of interest, but somebody yeah. should really look yeah. at that because. Yeah. I, I think that you know market drawdowns, first of all, are more pervasive than we think, and that it per, I mean, for most investors, it's going to it's going to present a tremendous stressor on, on, on an investor, you know. Uh, and I don't think uh, people appreciate that, you know, when, when you look at it. Um, I mean, just let me say, just let me make, just go down and make a few more points, you know. Um, I just want to say, real, a realistic statistical model uh, awaits in terms of understanding financial markets. You know, we're, we're unable to adequately model returns to reproduce with this, you know, so again, like I say, you know, if I put in an alpha stable, now again, uh, as the scene said, yeah, you put in a, you, you put in a mixture of alpha stables, you do get something that looks a lot, a lot more. And, and, but again, there seems to be some memory in there. So something like a hidden Markov process or some, some state memory that comes in that, that, uh, you know, is important, you know, but yeah, but I, I, right now I don't, I don't know how to do it, you know, so I don't. I mean, I haven't done it yet. I'm going to try and do it. If somebody else wants to do it, they're welcome to do it. I don't know. Um, but one thing I think is really important to say, it would be a mistake to view the Great Depression as an outlier. Because I, if one more person tells me that the Great Depression can't happen again, I'm going to, I'm going to have to kill them. <laughs> I'm going to, I mean, they're going to have to, they're dead. I'm going to have to kill them. They did seem to come close recently. Well, yeah. Well, so, but the point is that, if, if, you know, even, even without the observation of the Great Depression, such a such a thing is not even an outlier. I mean, we got to stop. You know, we got to you know look at the re reality here. Um, so yeah, you know, when somebody says, "Oh, you know, because we've learned so much," I mean, you know, I, mean, I just you know, just drives me crazy. Just drives me crazy. Okay, well, on that note, perhaps we should. Uh, okay. Thank, uh, All right. Well, well, I know I think there's someone. Yes, yes, sir. Okay. Uh, so I was just wondering. Well, well, again, I'm sorry. Okay. I, 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 again, you know, when I was doing this, I did. I, I wasn't. I, I wasn't at, at, at this stage looking at any cross correlation and that sort of thing. What I what I have thought about doing is looking at a regime switching model, where again you have these alpha stable emissions, and the probability distribution you're in any one emission state is controlled by some other exogenous variables like inflation and uh, something like that. So that would give you some, that would give some of the effects you'll look at. And as a matter of fact, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the first dissertation we produced out of Stony Brook out of the QF program was just on that topic on modeling the behavior of hedge funds, where we had basically a, a, a hierarchy of model. I mean, we, had, we had a sort of a bunch of sub-models, and which, which model this strategy sort of behaved like was controlled by certain macro, macro variables. And we used it. Yeah. Like, what yeah. you're saying is you don't really need regime shifts. 
Well, that is a regime shift, though. As, you know, in other words, that, that is a, I'm not saying, I don't know what controls the regime shift. Is it, does it, is it controlled by some exogenous collection of variables and some model that would allow you to, you know, generate that? Or is it something like a hidden Markov model? I don't know what the reg I don't know what the meta model is that controls the regime shifts, but I think uh, it's kind of obvious that there is regime shifts here, and, and they probably are alpha stable or something equivalent. Yeah, yeah I'm sorry. Yeah, um, I mean, where in the world? I mean, trans can be and I've been very surprised uh, that uh, the the way insurance people and finance people approach the question of risk is almost orthogonal. Finance people tend to look at time history, like you did. They trust people on the contrary to look at the, uh, at the cross uh, right. section of the, so they would look at the population. And when I was looking at that, you know, I was saying, okay, you're trying to go back very long to, to make your statistics. Right. But in fact, when you look at financial series, I mean, you have dozens of different indices. Right. You can multiply and you can observe the exact same. Similarity. Oh, uh, sure. Uh, you know, when you are doing I mean, it's, it's sometimes you, know, you, you want to say, well, if you want to, to understand what's happening, or that the Chinese market today looks like what was oh, yeah. the, right. the, 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 the US market post war, etc. Uh, so, so, first of all, I mean, this suggestion to do that is now to answer your question, which is we are missing an adequate model. What is an adequate model is not such an easy that, question. I, I agree with you. Yeah. The, the question that I'm upset with is more like what Daniel was asking, that is, uh, if we can uh, have some measure of temperature that tells us, okay, in here, we are, the, the probability of the drawdown, of, of the major drawdown coming is a bit higher than the, the than it's yes. like you know a uh, weather prediction right, right. that tells you uh, not something is going to happen, but the probability of something happening right. has risen, and that has a value. You know, also like for the insurance company, you know, oh, absolutely. Saying, you know exactly this type of mentality that could be useful not only for investors but also for regulators. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, and I think that's uh, you know. Uh, you know, one, I think that's one advantage of having uh, that's again. Let's talk about that, that meta model that selects what state is the guy's in. Um, it, it's much better if you have something that's driven by some other exogenous process that you can examine and and, and use to forecast and predict. Mean, even if you can just even if you just can observe it in situ and say, okay, this is where we're at, and this is this is the environment we're in. Um, and and obviously, if you if you look, I mean, the results here. If you looked at the at the uh, because they're highly correlated, the this and the the British market, you'd find us, you'd find everything's pretty much the same here. It's not necessarily exogenous. We're saying the correlations. Oh, no, no, but, but by itself. Yeah, right, right. An yes. indicator. Yes, oh, yes, sure. There's yes. a strong belief that there are financial bubbles, and that uh, you know, the slope oh. of the line is yeah. larger before the major. Well, you know, the, the thing is, though, that, you know, what's interesting here, though, is that these, these drawdown behaviors, which include the effect of financial bubbles, remember, I wasn't just modeling the big financial drawdowns. I was modeling all of them, right? And, and the, whole, the whole distribution fit very well, right? Because most of it, when, you, when, you, when you're, you know, in fact, if you use something, even if you use like a fairly tough one, like a Kolmogorov Smirnov, where you're looking at the maximum deviation in the, in the uh, CDFs, these, thing, these things are all the same. Perhaps, perhaps there are many bubbles. Well, well, yeah, well, maybe, well, maybe, you know, maybe then you end. You have this sort of fractal-like process, right? So I don't know. But, but the point here is that you know, it's um, 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 there's there's a there's a very definite, easily sort of identifiable behavior to these drawdowns, and it's been fairly stable over nearly two hundred years. And when you, and I will tell you, if you look at other markets, you will find exactly the same thing. And if you look at other types of markets, not just equity markets, you will find exactly the same. Okay. All right, well, there's one more yeah. question. I don't want to. Okay. Well, one second. Uh, 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 last last to, question. To, to change the focus and look at the good news, so to speak, yeah. as a complementary model or a complementary uh, problem, rather. Uh, uh, the events, uh, if we are sitting in, in very frequently in a state of depression, right? Well, draw, draw down, not depression. Yeah, okay. So the, the good news. Spice yeah. bubbles <laughs> will be a really extreme event, and statistics might be more interesting uh, because it seems that you are 
with normal, even with normal, you can explain a lot, right? You don't need even to go to alpha state. Uh, oh, no, no, yeah, no. But normal does it. Slide where the, the no, no, that, no, actually, normal. I think actually the, the difference was that with a normal distribution, the distributions of these drawdowns is exponential, which is not fat. I mean, it's just, you know, not very well behaved, you know, nice, furry distribution. You know, it's very, uh, you know, but. Yeah, it's memoryless, right? Right, it's memoryless, right? That's perfect, exactly. So, whereas, whereas the, whereas the, uh, uh, if you look at the real, the real markets, they have a Pareto distribution and uh, they have quite fat tails. I mean, those exponents were one, were between one point six and two point three, and those are relatively low exponents, and that means you have some fairly fat tails. Yeah, but the positive news, uh, it might be even more vivid. Uh, the, the fat tails of this division is really extremely bad. Right, but but I guess you, well, I guess what I'm saying is though the things that we we have to be you know when we talk about we talk about what's what may happen, we have to be prepared for what you know where I mean there's pretty good solid evidence that what may happen is pretty big. I mean you know it's it's you know and I think I think we we, we tend to you know we tend to yeah, first of all I, I, I think there's really two points here. One is that in order to gain some insight, you have to look back over long as long a period of time as possible. Two, it is surprising that many, many, many things you look at, um, you can go back 200 years and find the data is rel completely relevant. You know, it's very important to understand that. And 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 the third thing is when you do that and you are successful because it isn't always true that you can go back all this time. But when you can do that, you find you find some very surprising things about the world. You know, and 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 in finance, it's it's usually that we live in a fat-tailed world. Okay, so uh, well, let's thank Dr. Frey for a great show.